In organic chemistry, reaction mechanisms are depicted using the movements of electrons in each elementary step of the mechanism. And to depict these movements of electrons, we use a formalism called the curved arrow formalism. We've previously encountered curved arrows in the context of interconverting between resonance forms. And there, using curved arrows was mainly a bookkeeping device to show us how resonance structures were related and to help us make sure that we didn't lose electron pairs and in interconverting between resonance forms. And their meaning there was, was entirely on paper, entirely artificial. But in reaction mechanisms, curved arrows to some extent have a physical interpretation where an elementary step indicates actual chemical changes occurring. So we'll be breaking and forming sigma bonds in elementary steps and using curved arrows to depict these movements of electrons as reactants are converted to intermediates and then ultimately to products. Now, the first important point about curved arrows to make here is that curved arrows show how electrons flow. What you have to avoid is trying to use an arrow to show the movement of an atom. And we've previously seen curved arrows for proton transfer, and this is a good context to begin getting familiar with this idea. In a proton transfer reaction, H plus is transferred from the acid to the base, but we do not use an arrow like this to show that transfer. That would show the movement of the atom. What we're interested in is the movements of the electron pairs. And so we use two curved arrows because two electron pairs are involved in this process to show the transfer of a proton, H plus. Most generally, when drawing curved arrows, we start the tail of each curved arrow at an electron source. This is gonna be a concrete element in a Lewis structure, a lone pair, a pi bond, or in rare cases, a sigma bond. The head points to an electrophile, something that wants to accept electrons, such as the H in this acid HA. And more generally, we can think of that, this as an electron sink. This might be an electronegative atom, bromine, chlorine, oxygen. It might be an electrophilic atom like H in HA or a carbon in a carbon halogen bond or something like that. An electron deficient center can also be the point where a curved arrow ends. And these are really the two most general ideas about curved arrows to know. Now, a couple of things. First of all, rather than talking in detail about the curved arrow formalism, I'm gonna refer you to these videos by Professor Allison Flynn at the University of Ottawa. These are an amazing introduction to the curved arrow formalism, and I encourage you to watch them to get familiar with um, how curved arrows actually work. And what we're gonna do in the remainder of this video is just work a few practice problems. There are a limited number of things you can do with curved arrows. We're not gonna hit those in this video, but will in the next. And so you can't just do any old kind of electron flow using curved arrows, even following these two kind of most general ideas. And so while it may seem like curved arrows open the door to massive unmanageable complexity, the number of moves with curved arrows is actually limited and something that we can get a handle on and something that you will get a handle on between now and the end of organic chemistry too for the major classes of polar organic reactions. One thing we'll want to be able to do is look at reactant structures and product structures for an elementary step and draw curved arrows to show the movements of electrons that convert those reactants into those products. We're going to practice this on this slide, drawing the curved arrows that accomplish each of these following transformations, assuming they occur in a single elementary step. Here we're given that information, although in the near future you'll be able to categorize each of these as a particular kind of elementary step. All right, I think the most helpful way to do this is to look for bonds that are made and broken and lone pairs that are converted into bonds or vice versa. You can also look for places where formal charge changes to get a sense of where electrons are flowing. So in this first case, for instance, we see that this oxygen goes from having two lone pairs in water to having only one lone pair and being formally positive in the product. It also has a new bond to this cationic center, which goes from positively charged to neutral. This suggests the formation of an oxygen-carbon bond using one of the lone pairs on the oxygen, and we would represent that using a curved arrow like this. Notice that this oxygen goes from neutral to positive because it's given an electron away, at least formally. Right? It went from having two electrons and a lone pair to having formally only one of the two electrons in the carbon-oxygen bond. And likewise, the positively charged carbon has gained that electron in the new CO bond, and so it is now neutral. 
All right, in the second case, we have apparently the formation of a new oxygen-hydrogen bond in water, and we have the cleavage of this OH bond highlighted in blue. That OH bond appears to be converted to a new lone pair, and in a net sense, H plus is transferred from this cation to water. So we end up with positive charge in this H3O plus product and a neutral alcohol right here. And so apparently what's happening here is formation of a new OH bond now via donation of the electron pair on oxygen to the hydrogen and cleavage of the OH bond with the OH bonding electrons going to that oxygen on the left. Notice these electrons get converted into this new lone pair. This makes the oxygen neutral. It's picked up an additional electron formally when this bond was converted into a lone pair. And now this oxygen in converting a lone pair into a bond is formally positively charged. This last case here, we have a cation on the left and we have a new carbocation on the right and water as well. So what appears to have happened here is cleavage of this CO bond and its conversion into a new lone pair right here, right? So how do we show this? Well, we're gonna take those CO electrons and draw an arrow to the oxygen, indicating we're taking those bonding electrons and converting them into a lone pair at oxygen. This leaves this carbon deficient of electrons. Now it has formal positive charge, and this leaves the oxygen now formally neutral now that it's back up to two bonds and two lone pairs, six electrons formally. So this is a skill you'll want to get very, very good at, being able to look at reactants and look at products and see the electronic movements that converted the reactants into the products. Particularly when we know this occurs in a single elementary step, we should be able to draw curved arrows for electron movements in the step by applying these bookkeeping ideas that we looked at in this example problem.